Um, let me see if I can turn it off. There we go. So this is our nature preschool workshop. Um, first, I want to say thank you to all of you who are early childhood people and you spend so much time uh, just making their lives amazing. But so thank you for your commitment to them and for your interest in connecting them with nature, which is, I assume, while you're here, why you're here. Um, so this is me in the blue shirt, uh, and I am the director at Stokes Nature Preschool in Logan, Utah. We are about a mile up Logan Canyon. You'll see a picture of our location in a minute. And then the lady in the purple shirt is Kathy. She is our one of our lead teachers. Um, so between the two of us, we kind of run the program, and then we have a couple other staff members. It's pretty small, and our group of kids is small. That's us. Um, so I guess, actually, can I do this a little bit backwards? First, I'll show you the how, how we do our program. Um, and then I can show you, or sorry, the why, and then um, how we do our program. And then I can help you see if there are some of those hows that will work for you and your program. Um, so this is us. This is our building. We walk about a half mile up the canyon every day to get to our building. We started our program in the fall of 2013 as a pilot program. So it was really small. We just had one class of kids. Um, I was the only teacher and we kind of relied on a lot of parent volunteers to help us out because we weren't sure that it was going to go and that it would be popular. But it filled really quickly and we've been building on that ever since. And the reason we decided to start the pilot program was that we had a very successful parent taught program that catered to uh, very young children, but that was all we really offered for young kids. So our um, our gap was from about three years old to uh, our camp started with seven year olds. So we had a space in between there where we weren't really connecting with kids and getting them into nature the way we would like to be. Um, and also there were good models existing elsewhere in the country for nature preschools that were already uh, doing really well, and so we had some something to go on. We weren't re reinventing the wheel or anything. And um, in 2005, of course, if any of you are familiar with Last Child in the Woods, Richard Liu wrote a book about um, disconnect between children and nature, and he coined the term the nature deficit disorder, and that started a big uh, movement. So we just felt that it was time for us to go ahead and get in on that. And there are a lot of kids in London, so we weren't too worried about it as far as uh, having enough kids to fill. So we started out with two teachers, uh, or sorry, we, we now operate with two teachers to every eight students in a session. We operate Monday through Thursday with one morning class and one afternoon class a day. Um, our organization is a nonprofit, and the funding is tuition-based as well as some grants and donations that help fund the program. Um, we do have the ability to offer scholarships, which are completely funded through donations. So that's been a really nice thing for us too, as far as hopefully widening our um, scope and our the amount of families that we can reach. If it's only when it was only tuition based, it was definitely hard to imagine that we were getting everybody in there. It's getting a little bit easier for us through the scholarships to reach a larger variety of families. Okay, um, our guiding principles for the nature preschool at the center is sense of place, which is basically um, what we use when we, every time we try to make a decision or we try to decide if we're going to move the program in a certain direction, we kind of go back to that as our focus. Um, unstructured playtime, social emotional development, and the Montessori philosophy as a guidance as well. So we'll go into each of those. Oh, here's a good Mont Maria Montessori quote. Um, Education is a natural process carried out by the child is not acquired by listening to words, but by experiences in the environment. Just just an example of why the Montessori philosophy really lends itself to nature-based programs. So one of our main, um, I guess, part of the uniqueness of our program is that we spend a lot of time with unstructured playtime. Um, it's a category of play. 
in which children engage in open-ended play with no specific learning objectives. So even though we do have objectives every day that we'd like to see the students come out at the end of the week, maybe with certain uh, skills they've acquired or things that they can share with their parents, things like that. Um, with the open-ended, the unstructured playtime, it's, it's up to them what they're gonna get out of it. And the benefits, of course, cognitive, physical, it's the whole child, social, emotional, all of it. Um, it takes care of itself because they really are pushing themselves in whichever direction they feel like they want to go and we're just there to make sure they're safe and um, getting the most out of the environment that they can. Um, so what does it look like? For us, it looks like at least an hour a day of unstructured outdoor play. So we're outside for at least an hour unless the air quality is really poor or it's very, very cold. So if it's under 20 degrees, we cut that down just a little. And if it's below 10 degrees, then we really cut it down. Um, so then we have to do our unstructured playtime partially indoors. But usually we can do uh, an hour outside. My children choose how and what to play or do, and also who to play with. So um, really just up to them. The only thing we choose usually is the area that we're gonna all be so that we can have eyes on all kids. And also we provide materials sometimes to help guide the play or if we can see that certain kids really enjoy certain things, we'll make sure that we provide those things. Um, a lot of what our materials are what would be called loose parts. So we'll provide things that don't have a specific way of being used, but can be used in a multiple amount of ways. So things like big bucket full of sticks or um, uh, that's my favorite example. <laughs> um, but we also just have big buckets full of things like pots and pans or shovels and rakes and things like that that kids can take off and use in whatever direct, whatever way they would like. And often sticks end up being fishing poles or um, buckets end up being drums instead of being used for scooping sand. So we try to keep them really open-ended like that. This is something that as early childhood professionals, I'm sure you all are aware of what social emotional development is. Let's go through it quickly, but we do consider that an important part of our program. Um, their ability to understand their feelings, feelings of others, to control themselves, control their behavior, and to get along with peers since most of them are moving on to kindergarten once they leave our setting. So for nature-based approach, when we're talking about social emotional, um, we're really hoping to give them a sense of who they are in the natural world so that they feel comfortable in natural settings when they leave us and when they're with others or when they're, I don't know, just find, trying to find a, a place for them themselves and an understanding of themselves. If they have a sense of who they are in nature, that's a, a really nice starting point for them. Um, it helps them with the knowledge of how they learn and achieve their goals because they are learning and achieving goals when they're outside doing that open-ended play. Um, they're just doing it in their own way. But I think that as they go through it, they really start to become familiar with their own preferences and their own abilities. So it's really nice. Um, we encourage quality relationships with each other and also with the environment. And of course, we're going to have conflicts and challenges when we're outside. So they really get pretty good at resolving those and figuring out how to face challenges on their own or, or ask for help if there's a challenge that they feel like they need a little assistance with. So again, for us, what does it look like? Um, the students, I've got this little bar at the bottom of the screen, I'm gonna try to move it. The students treat each other, themselves and nature with empathy and respect. So we try to achieve that by modeling that as teachers. And also by specifically pointing out, you know, okay, this is something alive. We're going to be very careful with it. We're going to be respectful when we observe it. And um, we're going to leave things as we found them. Um, and then we also use that to go back to like, oh, well, we're also going to respect each other because we're alive too. And we're part of this too. So um, it's a good way to kind of model it. You know, if you're going to be kind to a worm, you should also be kind to your friend because we're all part of this big thing called nature. Um, and then, of course, social skills are really important when we're playing together because nature can be pretty, uh, it can be challenging. And if you're trying to cooperate and do something and you're, you've got a friend there who's also trying to do the same, um, 
it just really, it lends itself to cooperation and independence at the same time. Um, so if Sarah has her hand up, should I? Okay, Sarah, go ahead. If she's there. Sarah, do you have a question for Sadie? It might be an okay. error, but um, while we have a break, can I ask a quick question? Of course. Um, I've seen this um, in nature preschools, and it's, it's always fascinating to see. Can you talk a little bit about how you integrate you know, some of more of the traditional um, language, literacy, math, science types of things in your outdoor play? And if you're going to address this later, then by all means, wait. But I'm just kind of curious. I think other people. Yeah, might so that's actually almost like the whole second half of the program. Is I will show you a lot of examples of how we incorporate it and also how we communicate out with parents, because definitely they want to know that we're addressing the core, um, well, the core curriculum, basically, for pre-K and making sure that we are getting them school ready. So yeah, I'll show you a whole bunch of really great ways of, of um, documenting that and then also communicating that with parents. And if anybody else has questions, you can either raise your hand or tap them in to, or type it into the chat and we'll be glad and we'll be sure that Sadie addresses them. For sure. Okay, um, next, Montessori philosophy. So, um, Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Montessori. It, the goal would be nurturing each child's natural self-motivated desire to learn, basically, um, and for understanding and respect. It's really nice to have a philosophy that helps guide us that's also just so child-focused and um, child-directed, because really, nature preschools are that way anyway, but having something that is a little bit more concrete that you can kind of lean on when you need to. Uh, that's what Montessori is, does for us. Um, so of course, it's very hands-on and child-focused, both the philosophy and the materials, which is really nice because when we are outside and also when we're inside, we um, use very hands-on materials. We definitely have everything set up so that the majority of the time that kids are with us, they are making their choices and moving through things as they would like. We, just, we spend a little bit of time on group topics or group discussions and have um, like a story time where everybody's together doing the same thing at once but um, for the most part they're doing Montessori type things where they choose how they're going to spend their day. Um, we try to use natural items as much as possible and so I put a little example here you can see an example of using rock when you are learning letters so you can make alphabets out of rock. Um, we have a lot of other examples of ways that we use nature as either manipulatives or um, learning tools just to kind of keep that connection going even when we are in the classroom um, that we're still learning with nature um, and we use as many real tools as we can save nature use. kids love that right that's why they want to grow up and be big kids is that they want to have not the pink plastic shovel. They want to have the shovel that's metal and that mommy uses in the garden. Um, so we try to use as many of those things as we feel that they're ready for. And some kids are a bit young still, and so we don't pull out anything that's sharp or too heavy. But as they get better and better at fine motor and um, large motor skills and things like that, we try to make sure that we give them the chance to be as independent with with, with real items as we can, which is really fun. Okay, and then lastly, sense of place, which is kind of the core of our program. Um, sense of place is a familiarity, a belonging, and a desire to protect a place where you've spent time, time learning, time observing, interacting, places you've grown up. Um, so it's a deep connection to place. And if you grew up in this, you know, if you're one of those people who grew up in the same house from the time you were born to the time you left home and went off to college or whatever, that's your you know that place, you know it so well. Well, this is the hope that we're giving these, the hope is that we're giving these kids a sense of place in nature. So we spend a lot of time in the same areas. We have um, the same walk to and from preschool every day and they get to see how it changes with the seasons. They get to see what other animals might be using the same areas we're using. Um, and then they also just spend time playing there and, and interacting there so they get really comfortable with it. And hopefully that 
carries over to when they go to other places that are a natural setting that they already have a sense of like, okay, I, I know I belong here. I know what to expect here and I'm comfortable enough to go exploring or to feel safe in this place. Um, and I probably already just, you know, why is it important? Because, because we want to know that we feel like we belong. Um, this quote is, the more we learn about the place we're in, the more we, we realize how much there is to know, the smaller we understand ourselves to be, and the more we value our connection to place in each other. So part of the mission of Stokes Nature Center, which is our organization, is that we um, value stewardship. So we are hoping that these kids will also value stewardship as they go and decide how to spend their how to spend their time, how to spend their money, how to spend their effort. And we're hoping that they will value the nature that they grew up with. That's it. Um, so what it looks like for us is that we focus on the local stuff. When we teach different topics, we always have a nature topic every week and then we incorporate the literacy and the math and the um, physical education and all the other social studies and science. Um, it's all that's being guided by whatever our local nature topic is. So we use the local flora and fauna. We look at the only local ecosystems. So we aren't learning about penguins and we aren't learning about coral reefs. We are focusing on Logan Canyon. And some of the, um, we'll talk about the marsh that's in our valley as well. But we'll talk about things that kids are likely to experience as they live here in Cache Valley. We also talk a lot about our local community. So we try to include all kinds of connections, especially because we have family outings once a month. We try to always go somewhere that the community is a part of or bring in someone from the community who can share something awesome with us. Um, so we keep it, keep it as local as possible. And we also, of course, watch for our seasonal changes, which you can't ignore when you're outside. Okay, so now I was gonna ask how can you achieve this in your setting? Um, part of it is making sure that you and your students are often focused on something that can be seen or experienced at school or you know, in the environment that you are in. So in your setting, in your preschool, in your daycare, um, try to choose a place or a, a, an element of your outdoor setting that you can focus on and, and keep bringing it back to every year, or excuse me, every every week or even every day if you have time um, and then help them to monitor that themselves and be excited about the changes that they're seeing. If you have a garden, that's really a fun way to do that. Uh, if you have a local park that you are close enough to walk to, or if you just, I mean, maybe you're lucky and you have a really big open space with some natural elements, then um, making sure that you're focusing on that and that you're really helping them to make those observations and feel like they see how it things are changing and, and what's happening. Um, and become familiar with an outdoor space. So same thing, um, just finding a spot that would work for you and hoping that you can continue to uh, watch it and observe it. Okay, so does anybody have questions so far about just kind of how we do things in our program? And I will get to Jared, your uh, question about uh, the more of the curriculum type. Okay, I just have a quick question. I don't know if you mentioned it first uh, before and I saw I missed it. Um, what are the ages of the children in your program? Do you have oh, mixed sorry, ages? I should or? have said that. No, um, we do three to five. So kids have to be three to come into the program. And then once they turn five and, and are eligible to move on to kindergarten, then we uh, consider them aged out, basically. Perfect, um, thanks. Yeah, sure. The main reason I think that we set it at three, because I know that some preschools take two as well, but um, because we're outside, if they're not potty trained, it's very, very difficult to manage that. I wish we had an easier solution to that, but we kind of don't. That's just how it's got to be. So um, now we're going to talk about, this is kind of a brief one, but the benefits of taking students outside, because sometimes it's true that you know you want to have your kids outside. You know they love being outside. But you do kind of get some pushback sometimes from um, either administrators or parents. So let's look at the benefits that you can kind of 
mention or know about. And I included these, this is just a little piece of an infographic, but I included it in the um, resources that should be shared with participants. So you can pull these up and print them out or just use them to refer to. Um, they were put together by the Children in Nature Network, which is, this is their website down here. That I also put links to that on a Google document in the um, participant resources folder. So, anyway, learning in natural environments can boost performance in reading, writing, math, science, and social studies. These are all documented. So the little numbers down here, are sorry it's a bit fuzzy because it, I took it off of a big, a little one and made it big. But um, there's research, which is so wonderful. There's research to back all of this up and it's very well documented. So if you're the kind of person who really wants some concrete evidence for why you would want to do this, it's there, which is so nice. Um, it can enhance creativity, critical thinking, and problem solving. For sure, I don't know why, but when kids are outside, they just all of a sudden get really creative. <laughs> um, even seeing nature from school buildings can help with academic success. So even if it's just a big picture window that you can have a lot of time to spend around that window and have a way to see outside, that's even beneficial, which is nice if it's a time when you just really can't see outside, but you'd like to be able to at least have that connection. Um, it can help with focus and attention. A lot of kids have trouble with that, but when you go outside, it almost is a reset. So even if you need them to focus when you're inside, taking them outside for a while and letting them kind of, I don't know, just that's something with the brain, it helps them reset and they can come back and be a little more focused and attentive for that time period that you need them to be. Um, and it has helped kids with ADHD symptoms quite a bit as well. They've shown that uh, the greener the setting, the better the focus. And, and that also goes for kids who really struggle to focus. Um, so yeah, enhanced attention, spending time in nature helps them. It also leads to increased engagement and enthusiasm. So um, exploring and discovering through outdoor experiences can promote motivation and learning. It's true. I don't know why. Again, it. I think it's just the human connection with nature is really strong when kids are little, and if you can provide a setting for that, they really get excited. Um, it's like going to the real thing, you know, you learn about it, you see it in books, but if you just go out, it, there it is, and it's, you can touch it, you can experience it, you can be part of it, and it really does uh, spark them. It's pretty great. Uh, and improves behavior, which we all need in our settings, right? Uh, I do see this a lot in our kids, that those who have um, a really hard time with impulse control when we're inside, once we go outside, it improves. I'm not going to say it solves it. We still have those who really still struggle with impulse control, but it helps a lot. And the same with disruptive behavior. Um, there's just something about being outside that really helps them to control the aggression and um, you just have fewer discipline problems when we're outside. It's not none by any means, but it's it's less than it is when we go inside. I'm not sure I need to read more of the research, I guess, <laughs> but um, I don't know if they even know why, but it's documented that it does work. Okay, so here, um, I want you to think about your program and you know what what is it that you think could make this work for you? Some good, Things to think about are what do you want first? What are your goals for more outdoor learning? You can create short-term goals, look for long-term goals. Short-term is better, of course, in the beginning, and then working towards a long-term goal of, you know, we're going to spend an hour every other day outside, or we're going to spend 20 minutes observing nature twice a week. Um, and eventually leading to, you know, I'm going to teach these units outside only, or we're going to um, move to having all of our playtime outside, if that's your long-term goal. Um, whatever it is, if you think about your program, um, the way that I think kind of incorporate more outside time and more nature-based is to start with short-term goals, because I realize that it's a lot to just think, okay, we're all gonna go outside no matter what, 
uh, tomorrow. And then think about what you already have. What is your outdoor space like? Is it somewhere that you could maybe create a certain section of it that's very nature-based and doesn't have like uh, plastic climbers or um, toys like that? If it's if it's a place where you could kind of say, okay, here's where we're going to explore nature. And the only thing we're going to take with us is a magnifying glass. Or today we're going to explore nature and the only thing I want you to have with you is your journal and your pencil and you're going to just do a little drawing while you're sitting in this nature space. Um, if you have somewhere like that that you can access on a regular basis, that's a really nice way to get it started and to start incorporating it right away and also to start um, getting your students used to being in a, in a particular space that's safe and that has some outdoor, or excuse me, some nature elements. Um, also, do you have topics that work well outdoors? Um, I'll show you if I have time, if we have time at the end, I'll, I'll go through the shared folder with you with us a little bit. I shared a lot of the curriculum that we've put together that's Utah specific um, because when we're teaching certain things, we would find that, oh, well, this topic works really well, except all the books we can find have animals from Africa instead of animals that we're likely to see in Utah. So, for example, we're going to learn camouflage next week. Um, that's our topic, but I have a really hard time finding books that don't have zebras and cheetahs and exotic birds that are hidden well where they live. I have, couldn't really find any that were Utah specific, so we just made up our own kind of curriculum as far as found, finding pictures of local animals that are very well camouflaged in our landscape. So um, I shared a few of those with you all just to help you have some ideas for ways to make things more more local ways so that you can kind of incorporate that sense of place as well when you're teaching things like that. Okay, and then how can you get some help with this kind of stuff if you want to start moving more of your curriculum to an outdoor focused setting or even just a nature-based setting but with a little bit of an outdoor element to it. Um, you can see if your administration is on board to help you maybe purchase a whole set of rain boots for everybody that that way when it when it's raining you can go outside and see what's in the puddles and you don't have to ask parents to provide rain boots because you've got some for those kids who show up without them. Um, but parents are great too. If you have parents that you know are going to help support you on this, get them in there and have them, I don't know, encourage other parents who want to be outside with their kids too and, and really um, enlist their help when you need a few more eyes on everybody because you're going to go outside with 20 kids and there's only two teachers and you really just feel like, okay, I need a couple parents here to help us with this outing. Um, see, what, see what you can find. Uh, or if you have aides in your classroom, if you're lucky, and you have aides, they're great. Um, fellow teachers, if you have others who want to help you work together, of course, on putting together certain curriculum, uh, it's really nice to have two brains instead of one. Um, if you have a PTO, if you're in a setting where there is a PTO, I know a lot of early childhood settings are not set up like that because that's more of a school-based thing, but maybe you do. Um, SNC is Stokes Nature Center. That's where I work. If you look on our website, we have some resources, and we also have some links to places where you can get uh, local knowledge. There's a lot of YouTube videos because during COVID, we were doing a ton of YouTube videos. So even if you just want some information for yourself so that you can then share that with your kids, uh, we have some of that. Children in Nature Network is a huge organization. We have a ton of resources. You could go down a humongous rabbit hole with them. But if you're looking for certain resources or you want some really concrete research, that's a really good place to look. Um, and my favorite is the Natural Start Alliance. They are the nature preschool people. Um, resources like crazy articles that you can share. Um, they have a great book list that I put also in the resources folder for you all to check out. Uh, that's just nature-based books that incorporate also things like diversity. Um, they incorporate just everything. They really are, uh, it's a large organization. They have a lot of help putting together all their resources. So um, Natural Start Alliance is a really good place to look for anything you think you might need help with and then go from there. 
Um, okay. I have to keep moving this water around so I can see what I'm presenting to you. This one is based, is kind of geared a little, this is another infographic that you can check out, but this one I kind of liked just their little suggestions. It's a little bit of either parents or teachers, but um, providing fun, hands-on nature experiences, taking learning outside. I like this, like, this suggestion, have kids note three good things in nature every day to improve their connection with nature. So there's a good short-term goal, you know, okay, every day we're going to look for three awesome things and share that as a class. Um, and that can turn into the I found five, and then eventually it's just something that they just do on their own and look for amazing things in nature when you're outside. Um, sharing your love of the outdoors with children. Even if you're not like a super outdoorsy person, if you can go outside and also find three things that you're really enjoying about being out there or that you find fascinating out there, that obviously, if you're excited, they're excited. Um, and then repeat. Try to do it a lot. Um, meaningful experiences in nature guide children, youth, and adults toward care for nature. Again, that stewardship that we really are striving for. Okay, so here we're going to start answering Jared's question about how do we show that we're getting kids ready for the next step in life and that we really are um, following the guidelines that have been put in place by the people who know what they're talking about. Um, so this is something that I share with parents uh, quite often, not necessarily in this form. I don't send them a slideshow, but at the end of the week, I always send them a batch of photos to show what their kids were doing at school. And often I'll kind of put down at the bottom a little like, and this is the core curriculum that goes with that. Look what we're doing. And it's really great because I don't think that most of the parents that are signing up for nature preschool are thinking about that. But it really helps them to feel good about the choice they've made because their kids mostly are moving on to a public kindergarten and they want them to be ready. So of course, here's our new core standards. I have to admit a lot of the standards I have in this slideshow are from the old one because I didn't have time to update to all the new um, standards in this one, but they're all so basic. Um, I think you could easily make it work for the new ones as well. And then I wanted to also mention that there is a nature preschool professional practice guidebook now that Natural Start Alliance has put out and they guide nature preschools. And so we use both at our, at our school. We look through both. We look for the ways that we can incorporate both of the stand, both sets of standards and make sure that we're addressing both. Um, super helpful. So a little bit of a ling English language art. Here we are reading daily from text. So we just read that. Very easy to do, indoors or outdoors. When it's snowy, we're all in our snow gear and we're sitting around in the snow and we're having story time. Um, if it's too cold, you know, we read stories inside and then we'll just take books outside to look at. We don't necessarily make the kids sit still if it's cold. But when the weather is, is good for it, we, we have our story times outside. And then, of course, we just make sure that books are accessible indoors and outdoors so that no matter where they are, if they feel like they want to spend some time with work, they can. Um, letters, sounds, and phonemic awareness. So here's where Montessori really helps us out. We can do things like the rock alphabet. We use sand trays. We use natural objects like chestnuts to help create letters and practice uh, words that we come into contact with when we're out in the environment. So we are addressing, we are um, in, um, in reinforcing letters and sounds. We're using information gained from written sources. So when we're outside and the hummingbirds are around, then we make sure that we're reading about hummingbirds and that we're looking at pictures of hummingbirds and that we're making sure that the kids, when they see the hummingbirds, they feel like, I know because I saw in the book that they have really long tongues. And now I see that they are drinking from the feeder with those really long tongues. And then we will spend some time with our journals and help them to incorporate the things that they were reading or having read to them with what they are actually seeing. Communicating with adults and peers. We do that all the time. We do that all the time, <laughs> obviously. Um, 
they they really communicate like crazy when they're outside. So that's never tough to document. Experimenting with writing. So we spend a lot of time with writing material. <laughs> it doesn't always go on the paper, but that's okay. Sometimes you write on your hand. Uh, sometimes we write with sticks in the mud. Sometimes we will use um, colored water and paint brushes to paint letters on the snow. So depending on what we can do outside, we just try to make sure that we're doing a little bit of writing as well. Um, we use common words. So when we come inside from outside, we talk about the things we saw or the things that we know, the words that we know, and we use those words um, when we're inside to kind of recall what we just did or make plans for what we're going to do. Um, so plenty of words um, when we're inside. And then some when we go outside, although not so many, um, I have seen nature preschool, preschool that do a really great job of labeling everything outside, but because we are in a spot where our trail and our play area is a is public access. We don't really leave stuff out because it just gets destroyed, unfortunately. Here's some math examples. We find a lot of snails, uh, snail shells on the trail that we walk to and from preschool. So we just collect them and then we use them as counters. Here we are counting worms. So we brought worms in, we dug up a whole bunch and we brought them in and then we counted how many we got. Then we measured the one. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Worms are gross, but the kids love them. Uh, and then we do, I mean, they do so much of this describing and comparing measurable attributes on their own. Uh, if I pour enough water in this bucket, it's going to overflow. You know, if I need another bucket, I'm going to have to go get another bucket. Or um, and they just they measure and compare constantly when they're outside to take pictures and let people know. I didn't, okay, so shapes. Shapes are really fun when we go outside. Here's the Montessori version of identifying shapes when we're inside. Um, and then we go outside and we take these little shape cutouts that are laminated with us. And we find things outside that are roughly those shapes. And we bring them back and we see which shape they're the most like, um, share them around. We also make these little necklaces with shapes on them. And then we go for a walk and we try to find those shapes as we're walking around in nature. Of course, learning with science. Learning and science are also very easy when you're outside. Um, sense of curiosity. Just every kid has it. We just really um, we don't let it go. We, we As soon as they're curious about something, we all go focus on that one thing and we all will spend time, you know, we get the caterpillar and we put it in the container so that everybody can look really closely at the caterpillar. And then we're going to go look it up and see what kind of caterpillar it was and what's it going to turn into when it goes through metamorphosis. Um, here we're going to hide in the bushes so we can get a better look at the hummingbirds. And here we're going to dissect these flowers that we got from the local forest before they threw them out. And we're going to just take them apart and see what's inside. That's pretty easy. Confidence in a range of abilities. Um, they get better at climbing, and here this one's holding my hand as I take the picture, but eventually he'll feel confident enough to not need my hand. Um, this little guy had never gone fishing before, and we do outings this year, this particular year, we went ice fishing, and uh, he talked about it the rest of the year. And he felt like, okay, I know how to fish now. I'm good. So. And tell you all about it every day, but it was great because his, you know, his self confidence is huge after that. Um, and these kiddos are snowshoeing, so we try to just make sure that we give them the chance to try different things. And this is a really great thing too, because usually when we're doing these outings like the ice fishing, we um, have families come. So then we're introducing nature to the whole family, and it, it really does help them to feel like, okay, well, even when preschool's over, we're still going to go out and go fishing because we loved it. Um, so it's really nice when we can connect with everybody like that and have that connection between home and school. They persist in completing tasks. This kid is going to pull every sunflower seed out of that sunflower head with tweezers. He's also practicing his pincher grip for pencils. 
um, and hopefully we'll use it when we take out the hunting. Um, these kids built the grubbiest snowman that ever lived all by themselves, <laughs> pushing these giant snowballs up this really muddy hillside, but they did not have a teacher help them at all, and they really worked for about an hour to try to get those snowballs up the hill. Um, so, yeah, very persistent and really um, a lot of cooperation and communication here. Working collaboratively with others, if you're going to sit in a fort that has a tiny little opening, you got to cooperate and work together or somebody's going to get squished. And if you're going to have a party at the mud kitchen, everybody has to have a job so that it's ready in time. Definitely collaborating here. And using their senses. We do a lot of toilet paper roll. Uh, binoculars. We always look for animal tracks in the snow or the mud and make sure that we're measuring them and comparing them to the others that we've seen. We take pictures so we can put the pictures up when we're inside and we'll remember when we saw that one. Um, that way, the week that we do learn about tracks specifically, we can go back and look at the ones we spotted earlier in the year and try to decide what exactly that animal was. Colors, of course, colors and textures in the environment. This particular year, we were really lucky because one of our students' father was a, is an ornithologist at the university nearby, and he came and did some mist netting. So he caught this goldfinch and a couple others, and the kids got to watch how that works and then to pet the goldfinch, a wild bird. So we don't do that every year, but just an example of things that. Um, you know, connections they can make that are also helping them to learn just the basic skills. Uh, paint chips are really awesome. We use those a lot to go looking for colors in nature and finding ones that match the paint samples. And they're free. And they recognize changes in season, of course, because they're outside, so they have to dress appropriately. Um, everything changes as the seasons change. Exploring parts of plants, we dissect plants, we talk about their different parts, and then in the spring we plant seeds and watch them grow. Uh, we don't have a garden because we're in a canyon and the sun is not predictable enough for that, so we actually grow plants inside and watch them. And then in the spring we go out and look for the plants that are starting to grow, but we don't have an outdoor growing space. We explore different parts of animals, so we have an owl costume so that we can talk about its different adaptations. We catch invertebrates in the river. This is the river that's near our preschool space. Um, so we use that space to catch invertebrates and examine them and look at them really closely. And then we identify them based on the books that we have about them. Okay, and then some social and emotional goals from the curriculum, developing a capacity for independence get my own water from the river, I can pour my own water for snack time, I can climb the tree without anybody's help, things like that. Um, expressing themselves in different roles and mediums. They can use their snow shovel for they want. If it's a guitar, it's a guitar. Um, we also provide some more traditional things, like they do a lot of painting. Um, these kids turn their buckets and rakes into musical instruments and they form a band and they did a performance for us. Um, I don't know how they came up with that, but it was great. Uh, cooperative play, again, here it's their job to fill up the bird feeder, so they work together on that. This is the day when they all decided they were going fishing, and when we have eight kids in a boat, in half a boat, we only have half a boat. Eight kids in half of a boat requires some cooperation, for sure. But they, they do that kind of stuff all the time, and we just kind of work to make sure that nobody's feeling left out or that uh, the, I don't know, the quieter kids or the ones who are a little bit more reluctant to get in there have a chance to still take part in some cooperative play. Respecting others, using polite language and taking turns. Of course, these are important skills for when they move on to a larger group setting. Um, so we just really encourage it and we really reinforce it. Uh, when kids are really modeling good behavior, we have little 
preschool little recognition papers that they can take home and share with their parents and we'll kind of make sure that we send that home with it's almost like a great job note <laughs> that they get to take home and creative art we do music outdoors until it's too snowy and then our music teacher who you see here on the bench um she has a lot of instruments so we go inside when it's either too wet or if the snow is too deep because then we don't want to get those instruments in the snow. Otherwise, we do music outside. So we do learn lots of simple songs. We do a lot of dramatic play. Um, sometimes we provide some things for that. So we do have like these wings that we'll use when we're talking about insects. We also have some bat wings. But they also do dramatic play with their own things. So here we have stick antlers or an icicle unicorn. Um, but we really do encourage dramatic play. And sometimes that does take a little bit of teacher prompting to kind of get it started and then they're off and running. <laughs> we do a lot of physical health and safety stuff. Uh, they have fine motor control practice with the tweezers and with other small tools that we provide. So we have a little drill that they take turns using for drilling into pumpkins. We always supervise this way. Um, one of the new core ones is holding a pencil and other writing tools at the beginning of your graph. So that thumb to index in your graph. Um, we use a lot of tweezers. They just really like them. But we also use things like paintbrushes outside or um, we have a hammer in where you have to hold the nail and, and do the hammer. So anything that can help, help them use those two fingers together, we try to always have it available if they want to use it. And then we do art outside too. Gross motor skills, gross motor coordination, I should say. That you can't even be outside without some of that. So we just take pictures of it so the parents know that they're developing their gross motor skills. <laughs> they really don't have to have any help from us because everything we do outside uh, encourages that. Safety rules. We have to do things like we all walk on the mountain side of the trail rather than the river side. You can't see it here, but the river is right here. So to keep kids safe, we always stay on the mountain side. When we do go down to the river, it's only if there's an adult present. They all they know the rule about that that you can't go without a teacher. We also have we have a fence, but I mean it's it's just a split rail fence, so it would be easy for them to sneak under or over it and still go to the river, but. Um, we really, really focus on those rules for the first couple weeks of school until we just can see that everybody gets it. And then they really are really good at telling each other, like, hey, you can't go there. Or, Remember, go on the mountainside. So um, it takes care of itself for the most part. And we kind of reinforce it every day. Remember, can't go to the river. Um, and things like this, we use, it's hard to see because he's moving really quickly, but uh, we use vegetable peelers as. Uh, wood whittling in instruments, so we teach them how to use those spaces before we cut them loose with those. Okay, so how do we ensure success and safety? Well, when we talk about being outside, a lot of times we, especially in our setting, because we are in a very nature-based setting, um, there are hazards and risks, and we talk a lot about how there's a difference. A hazard is something that could cause harm, something like the river or loose boulders or a lot of ice, um, something sharp. The risk is the chance that that will actually cause harm. So when we talk about risky play, we're talking about um, making sure that if it's a hazard that is too risky, if, if the likelihood that it will cause harm is too high for our setting, then we will remove that hazard. But if it's something where we could mitigate or take care of it to a point where we can still be in the in the area, then we still play there and we still let kids know, okay, there's a risk here. You're gonna go ahead and um, follow certain rules to decrease the likelihood that you'll get hurt, or you're gonna decide not to play there, however you feel. Risky play is important for the development of confidence, autonomy and physical resilience. So in any natural child-directed setting, students will find a way to engage in risky play, even if we don't think that they will or should, they're going to. So knowing this, if we plan ahead and we manage the risk to avoid harm, then we can make it acceptable. 
And then we can give them the chance to make those decisions on their own, which is a really important part of them growing up. So I put here an example, and I shared this with you all in that um, resources folder as well. But this is what we use at our, in our setting. We have a benefit risk assessment. So anytime something comes up where we're not sure if we should allow them to do a certain thing, then we fill out one of these benefit risk assessments. So here's our example. We have a sandbox that if it, in the spring, the snow will melt, and then it will refreeze at night, and all of a sudden the sandbox is in an ice rink and kids still want to play on it. So it makes you a little nervous because they all run over there and then they all start slipping and falling on their butts and they're going to hit their heads, they're going to bump into each other. So we um, filled out a benefit risk assessment. And the benefits of playing on that ice are that they develop balance and large motor muscle control and awareness of space. You know, there's somebody right next to me, I need to be careful not to run into them or, um, bring them down if I fall. Uh, and it promotes an, an ability to assess risk and decide on your own comfort level and your awareness of your body and your level of comfort with those risks. Uh, the risks involved are that children will probably slip and fall. They could hurt themselves if that happens. If they have a stick in their hand, they can fall on it or they can accidentally smack somebody else with it as they're falling. Um, a slick of water is likely to develop on the top of that ice rink when it's warm enough, which makes it even more slippery and also makes it so that if they fall, they get really wet, but it's still really cold outside. So being wet when it's cold is not ideal. Um, so then we talk about safety policies. The safety policies are the part of this assessment that you as teachers are all going to be aware of and keep in mind. So we decided that we have yak tracks, which are traction devices that you can strap onto their boots. And we have a set of eight so that each student can have a pair of yak tracks on if they want to. So we decided that if they want to play on the ice, they're just going to have to sit down and let us put yak tracks on their feet. And that the rules would be that they can walk or crawl on the ice, but they can't run or jump. They can't take sticks on that ice rink with them. Um, and that the teacher has to look at the ice every day and decide if it's okay to play on it or not, because if it's not, then they don't do it. Um, and also the teacher can say, okay, three kids at a time on the ice. And then, you know, we'll give you 10 minutes or whatever, and then we're going to switch and let the next three kids have a turn. So, and then the rules are the parts that we discussed with the students. So this is just an example of something that you can do if you feel like you need to really make decisions about places that seem risky or activities that seem risky, um, rather than just saying, ah, oh, we're not going to do that. Forget it. Because sometimes the benefits are are great and the risks are not as intense as you thought they may, might be or as scary as you thought they might be if you take certain steps to kind of minimize the chance for harm. Um, I gave you a, a blank template for this should you like to use it when you're assessing different outdoor play areas in your setting. Okay, then we talk about preparing parents for outdoor preschool experiences. I have a YouTube video that outlines everything a parent would need to know before preschool begins. It's basically just a tour of our parent handbook. So I share that with parents uh, about a month before school starts. Um, then we have in-person orientation where they come up and they see the school, they explore the setting, they meet the teachers, and they really see what it's gonna look like when they come to school. Um, then I ask them to physically prepare their kiddos, especially if they're three-year-olds and they're, uh, they haven't been up to preschool before. So I ask them during the summer to start spending time outside and to taking long walks and then teaching them how to put on their own outdoor gear. So here's how you put on your rain boots. Here's how you're going to zip up your coat, things like that. Okay, Sadie, it looks like we're running out of time. We're okay. going to be starting the next one soon. So uh, if you want to... Finish up, that would be great. Okay, sounds good. So I do um, a list of the gear that they're going to need, and I show them some examples of the gear that has worked for us in the past, and then we always communicate with parents what they're going to need to bring and what it's going to look like if their kiddo comes home with a little bit of an incident of any sort. So um, let's see. I can go through this because 
This is probably stuff that you want. And then we're back to the, how can you make it work in your space? So if there's anything that I can help you with setting goals or finding resources, let me know. Thank you so much, Sadie, <laughs> for this presentation sure. today. It contains some great valuable information on how important um, nature learning is for young children. I have um, put in the chat link a couple of times. I'm going to put it in one more time for the sign up sheet to make sure you signed up to get credit for this session. And we are going to be getting the next session at two o'clock uh, pretty soon. Well, thank okay. you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Remember, this, the resources for this presentation are in the resources folder. Um, the link to that is in the chat, too. So thank you very much, Sadie. You bet.